Great. Everybody, welcome to CKMA. Today's guest truly understands the power of bringing your ideas to life. From a young age, he started off teaching himself to code in order to put his parents' business online and quickly advanced to starting a business of his own. With a foot in multimedia and another in web services, he worked on his own personal projects while going to school. Although he believes the CS degree he inevitably received discredits him from the self-taught community, he is very much representative of building projects that have actual utility to solve real world problems. Please turn your cameras on, unmute yourselves, and help me in welcoming a senior software engineer at Cover My Meds, Paul Scherer. Welcome, Paul. How's everybody doing? Hey, Paul. Hello. Hello. Intro. Welcome, Paul. Hey. Hey, Paul. How's everybody doing tonight? Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Paul. We really appreciate you coming on to talk to us. Um, I'm really appreciative of like your initiative of actually like doing things to solve the problems that come your way and like learning and building those things. I'd love to start off with like that process that you came from like, oh, this is something that would be cool to see in the world to eventually having those skills to make that come to life and then ultimately like coming to terms with your own business. Yeah. Um, that process for me even to this day, a lot of it is nested in just this constant. I, I picture it like a, a dog after a bone. It's like you have this problem you want to solve, something you want to do, and I feel like I'm constantly chasing it. And it was something that, um, as a you know young child, uh, I had that feeling, and I, but it's something that I still have today. And I can kind of that'll be kind of a theme throughout uh, the conversation tonight. Um, but that's really where it started, um, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, the very first thing that I um, kind of got wind of, and I guess to kind of context this briefly, um, I grew up in the middle of the Allegheny National Forest on a very small farm um, in the middle of nowhere. We had like old school dial-up internet and, uh, that moved at the speed of molasses in wintertime. Like, um, but my parents had a, a business and that, that first problem, this was early 2000s, right around the dot-com boom. And um, I, I, everybody was coming online. The internet was this thing um, and I wanted to understand it. And so I had this, this problem. I, I just said to myself, I wanted to get my parents' business online. And um, I kept running up against Hurdle. And while I didn't know what I was doing, I was a kid. I didn't have any resources. I can remember still going to asking my parents if we could go to Walden books where I bought two programming books off of the out of the reference section at Walden books and um, just started reading them and started messing around um, again, having no idea what I was doing, but constantly being fueled by this, um, this problem. I want to solve it. And the cool thing uh, I'll say, it's cool. It, the, the thing you'll get used to in software engineering and programming is that there's always another hurdle. Um, there's always another thing, another way to push the envelope, another way to, um, you know, something else to learn. And that's what really kind of kept me interested in developing things and um, solving problems, bringing them to life, and then running into new problems and kind of solving them and bringing them to life. Um, and I did that as a young kid um, for many years up until I found out that people would actually pay me to solve their problems. And that's what kind of got me into um, just creating my own business from there. Yeah. So how would you like, I know that there's probably a handful of, actually probably a majority of, no, probably not a majority, but there's a lot of people in the chat that are kind of going through the motions of trying to teach themselves um, how to code. But sometimes it's, it's hard to really identify um, even like how to start. Um, how would you advise like those people that just are kind of struggling on how they can just start learning how to code on their own? Yeah. So for me and with some of the folks I've worked with, it always, I recommend always having some problem, like some, um, just like if you're setting goals, some like, I know I will have reached it when I've accomplished this and this is what it's supposed to do. Um, 
and making sure that there's something concrete that you're you're working towards and then as far as like getting started it's like running and hitting that wall and getting knocked down and then standing back up and running at it again i mean uh when i was starting out like it was just searching on things online a little bit most of it was finding reference books and reading them trying things and then um, occasionally going and finding something else that kind of worked similar to what I was doing and going and reading code, even though I might not have had really any idea what it was doing. It just kind of start, things started to, to become familiar. Um, I, it's very close to if anybody has learned another language or speaks multiple languages, it's similar, like, like conversational languages. Um, it's similar to that aspect. When I was learning another language um, in high school, when you're starting out, you don't, everything's foreign, but the more time you spend in it, the more time you can draw correlations between things. You might not fully understand over time everything, but things start to, patterns start to emerge and you start to recognize things and you can start to, based on the context, start pulling things together. Um, and so that's what I would say for folks that are getting started is like, make sure you have a problem, make sure you know you're working towards something or else you kind of get, can get scatterbrained or not really sure if you've solved something. Um, and then just kind of start that iteration. It's, it's really an iteration. You're going to go do something, see if it works or see if you can learn something, um, step back and then reapply and just keep, keep hitting it. What would you say would, was like the hardest thing that you had to like get over through that process? Myself. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, just getting in my own way. I think, Early on, um, and this isn't something until I like, came to terms with um, just several years ago, um, was not having really anybody to compare against or really converse with. Um, this, this is the reason why I think things like Career Karma are awesome is because it builds that community, which is something I didn't have uh, when I started for many, many years. Um, so part of you know some of the biggest hurdles was am I spinning my wheels? Am I wasting time going down these rabbit holes and spending days or weeks with something not working and then not giving up, um, kind of rallying and, and figuring out another way um, or just persisting and, and eventually overcoming. Um, but yeah, some of it is just trying to figure out like, why am I doing this? Um, and then things start to fall into place and you get a reward and you start to understand this is why I do it. I really enjoy this. But yeah, I'd say one of the hardest things wasn't any concept or anything. It was just my getting myself out of my own way. So did you actually end up finding a community that you could rely on? Or was this mostly like you brute forcing this and trying to like find anything and everything that you could? Yeah, I was on my own um, from the early 2000s until about 2014. Um, so like six years ago when I moved for grad school, um, to a new city that was, um, much more metropolitan than where I was from and they had a, a meetup group. And so I started attending there. So I started interacting and conversing with, um, other engineers socially rather than just work. I mean, I'd worked with other engineers and worked with people. Um, but for me, that's all, this was two different contexts. It was like, um, like I knew I could get work done. I knew what I could do. I knew I could write proposals and talk to clients and do all this work. Um, but getting down to, you know, what is it actually like to be an engineer and talk with other engineers? That wasn't something until about six years ago when I moved that I actually started to, to find a community for. So now I kind of want to open up the conversation to everyone else that's on this call tonight. If you have any questions, um, please actually like the way that we did this yesterday where you can actually raise your hand in the zoom call uh, I'm, I'm thinking that there's a little um, option on the screen for you to raise your hand in order to like let us call on you and then when when called upon you can go ahead and just like unmute yourself um, we'll go through some of the questions in the chat as well but yeah if anyone has any questions um, I guess for this first one, you can go ahead and just unmute yourself and then go ahead and ask Paul. I see Luna has her hand up. Go for it. 
Yeah, awesome. Okay, I just figured out how to do that. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, because I am self-teaching right now and I'm struggling with rather not to go down the path of going to a camp or continuing to uh, self-teach uh, myself, now knowing what you know, if you do it all over again, would you still go the route of teaching yourself or would you go down other avenues? Yeah, good question. Um, it's, it's one I get a lot. Um, I, the way I look at it is everything in this field, it is possible to teach yourself. Um, what I wouldn't have done, um, and Melvin kind of uh, included this in the introduction, is um, went into debt, into student loan debt to go to college for it. Um, that I didn't spend any time um, on this major when I was in, in school for it. Um, because I was well, by doing it for years prior, um, was well beyond where the, the educational system is for this field. Um, but a boot camp versus self-teaching, uh, the way I look at it is if you, uh, it's really an onus on yourself. If you have the ability, if you see yourself making progress in being able to teach yourself and hold yourself accountable and find projects of your own that you can work towards, uh, and continue to develop skills and you don't feel like you're flatlining, then I would wholeheartedly encourage you to keep teaching yourself. I think it's entirely um, possible to do that. Not everybody learns like that though. And that's where I think boot camps step in as another alternative, another tool in the toolbox for a resource for people who really want to um, move into, into this field and, and learn um, to take advantage of. So uh, I don't think it's impossible. If I was to do it again, I think I would still, um, teach myself. I was pretty successful and have been pretty successful um, with teaching myself. Um, but I would put an asterisk to that and say that community and having other people is super important. So if there's a way to, uh, while you're teaching yourself, don't isolate yourself, still find that community, which obviously you are because you're here tonight. So props to you. Yeah, this is like for everyone else that's on here as well, like taking this one hour out of your day just to like um, towards your own personal growth, right? is like a great step in that right direction. And we'll be here to like continuously try to provide you guys with like support and the resources and everything that you need to get you to where you want to go. Um, so appreciate you all for, for joining us tonight. Um, we do have a handful of people that have their hands up. So let's start with Jared and then I'll grab one of the questions from the event sign up. So we did have registration questions to ask and then we'll have um a chat question that? that we'll pull up yeah go for okay. it yes thank you hi paul how you doing tonight mm -hmm. hey hey uh question was um i i put it in the chat so let me look at i was like do you recommend getting good at working on the command line with windows or in linux outside of the programming languages or would you say it'd be best just to focus on the program on the programming languages then later on come back to those and Sasha also asked just to add on to this, because um, they are they are kind of related. What programming language do you recommend to start with? So you can knock those both out. Sure. I'll start off with, regardless of whether you learn CLI and command line stuff before or during, it's important mm -hmm. to learn it. Um, now I would say it's it's up to you. There there are two different things. It's great to um, focus on the programming language side because that's where you're going to, if you, if you strictly want to do programming, yeah. then there, depending on the organization and, and where you end up working, um, a lot of places, if you're a programmer, you're just programming. Um, especially with, um, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, that. To know the programming language, to be the programmer, most cases, that's the, where the expectation is. When you do um, command line stuff, Linux, um, working with um, you know, different system level stuff, such as setting up servers, um, virtual host directories, things like that, uh, mm. beyond just your change directory, your CD and list directory stuff, um, that's, that ends up being more of like an operations role. Um, I've been in roles though where those have, have overlapped um, so it's always beneficial to know like where your code is running and how to, to interface with that environment. Um, 
So I, I would say it's important to learn, but whether it's before or before, well, if it's whether during, after, or before your programming, um, that's up to, to you um, because mm -hmm. it's a different um, paradigm. What would be an interesting exercise, and I've done this with some folks, is we've gone through um, and doing our own deploys. So you write the code, but let's say you're doing web development. It has to obviously be hosted somewhere. And yeah. you could do, like, if you want something quick, you go with a Netlify or um, something that's self-hosted and they'll, they'll handle all that backend stuff for you. Um, exercises I've worked with people is just get like a digital ocean box, bare bones and figure out how to install your own server or how to start that server and, and run your website yourself. Um, those are very um, lower tiered as far as the involvement processes mm -hmm. to actually wrap your like to to do but those yeah. will in, in, in undoubtedly get you knee deep waist deep in server level stuff cli stuff operating system stuff um and that's a good way to kind of tie the two together um Reason I, yeah sorry sorry go on i was just gonna to tack onto that the, the other question on programming language um, which is another question I get a lot and I'd say it doesn't matter, um, with an asterisk. So it doesn't matter <laughs> because you pick one and you, you learn it. The second one's going to be easier. Your third one's going to be easier. Your fourth one as you go is going to be easier. Um, you just got to pick one. The asterisk is for, if you know that you want to do a particular, if you have a goal in mind, um, then I would pick the one that's most appropriate to that. And you can find that through quick Google searches or talking with people. So if you're looking into web dev, you know, JavaScript would be a good one to start picking up out of the gate. If you want to do data science or machine learning stuff, pick Python. If you're looking for, you know, server backend stuff, pick up a Ruby or a PHP. If you want to do gaming, pick up a C++, C Sharp. Um, that's the only like asterisk on that, which one to start with. Um, yeah. Thank Anything you, Paul. Else? Yep. So I think Harrison's up next. Are you familiar at all with Springboard? Yeah, the, I'm kind of familiar. I've heard of them. Okay. Have you heard positive things from them? I haven't heard anything either way. I just know that they exist. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering, like, what are your thoughts on um, full-time programs versus part-time programs? Yeah, uh, I don't know that I, so my answer would be it it's depends on your situation. Um, I don't have too much experience with boot camps myself um, or those, those types of things myself, other than um, talking to people who have gone through them and who have graduated from them. Um, but yeah, I would say it, it whatever, uh, fits your, your schedule the most and what you're comfortable with. Um, ultimately you, you want to learn stuff. So if you can't, you know, my advice to anybody would be if you can't swing a full time because it's going to leave you, um, tired and unable to learn anything, then do the part time and, and try and learn on yourself or do some extra stuff beyond that, that classwork as you are able. Um, but yeah, I'd, the best advice I can give on that. Yeah, Harrison. Also, um, so we will have uh, like a, someone from Springboard coming on next week on Monday. So that that would be like a really great question to ask her when she comes on. Um, I'll be creating like those events, and you'll see them pop up and creep in. We'll send out a newsletter to make sure that everyone here is aware of like what events are upcoming. Um, but yeah, we're going to be having people from our, all sorts of different boot camps. Um, yeah, I would say also the same. It really is dependent on like what your goals are and everything, but you can always ask your coach and, and everything, but definitely bring that back up on Monday. Thanks for your question though. Thanks a million. All right, Michael. Hold on, Paul. Hey. Right. So my question is, um, for those who have been learning code for a while and they're in the job hunting process, uh, what advice would you give to help them with like code in purgatory where you're trying to like stay sharp on your skills and on top of stuff, but you uh, wonder if you like know enough? Yeah. Um, I still ask myself that every day. Do I know enough? <laughs> um, it, I'd say like 
specifically with regard to like interviewing and keeping up with stuff? Is that where the question is coming from? Or just been coding a while and like, how do you continue to keep your skills sharp? Uh, probably, probably more so both like trying to keep your skills sharp and, you know, you know, you, you go through the process of like doing coding challenges and trying yeah. to projects, but you like, you might, you know, struggle with your schedule and stuff like that. Like what was some advice you give to keep, you know, on top of those things. So you're ready for an interview. Yeah. Um, I'd say, I mean, I read a lot um, and f- like just news and real like releases and um, blogs and stuff for what people are working on. So sometimes even if I'm not actually programming um, and I might not even be like in the computer, it's just like if I'm on a trip or I'm somewhere else, like I'm still staying engaged. So I know what's going on. Uh, that's how I get a lot of like, what do I want to look into next? Um, Cause I'm constantly like, experimenting and, and kind of playing with things that are out there, stuff that I might not be doing on a, the day to day, but something I read about and, and found interesting. And so that keeps me coming back um, to and engage with what else is out there beyond what I'm working with on a daily basis. Um, yeah. On a, I guess while you're interviewing and all that, um, I don't know. I don't know. Other than like, trying to remain intentionally involved one way or another. Um, the, the one downside to the practically applying this skill is that I can't write code unless I'm at the computer. So if I just don't have time or I'm somewhere else or like unavailable, um, stuff doesn't get done. So short of reading and engaging that way, um, I don't know how you would uh, continue to, to stay active. Um, yeah. Great. Kava. Kava? Kava. Yeah, that's me. Kava. Great. Hi. Um, so my question is more long term regarding. So I'm someone who has historically, I've, I used to be in the sciences, like neuroscience, and then I ended up switching to more like social sciences, but I've always had a passion for like environmentalism and sustainability. I'm really, sometimes when I hear about software engineering jobs, I feel like, I mean, at least at my tech company, like we just, I see a lot of the engineers are kind of isolated and sometimes it feels like there's not a lot of work-life balance. And so this is a two-part question. One, like, there's a stereotype around like what like what kind of folks like tend to be software engineers and what kind of folks tend to be um, UX designers and I'm wondering um, for people like how like you navigate those stereotypes and then like how um, those are three questions how do you navigate those stereotypes to um, work life balance especially at a time like now where everyone is attached to their computer how do you create space between like being on your computer for work and being on your computer for fun, I guess. And the last question is more around, um, like as someone who's interested in environmentalism, I'm interested in trying to hone my skills so that I can um, assist maybe like organizations that are, or companies that are more geared towards like sustainability and like whatever, like life sciences, I want to, I want to see if I can try to help them engineer their website or like create product that can um, help them meet their goals. And so there's a lot of questions in there, but I was hoping if you could first address the sort of stereotyping, B, um, address your work-life balance, and then see if you can try to offer some guidance as to ways to use your engineering skills for good, if possible. <laughs> Sure. Um, so the, the stereotype, um, this is something I run up against all the time, um, mostly because I'm very outgoing and involved in kind of the opposite of what people, the stereotype is. Um, but what's been nice about that is I've kind of, in a lot of my roles, served this um, technical role within product. Um, so being able to discuss with um, business owners or clients the technical requirements um, and kind of finesse those out and then take those back to JIT to engineering and apply and actually have the the engineering, the technical conversations with those folks. Um, but yeah, around the stereotype, how do I navigate it? Um, it I think it's perfectly fine. Um, I guess it, it depends on the culture, but the, the, a lot of the cultures I've been a part of, it is 
fine for engineers who like to keep to themselves to keep to themselves. Um, and, and it's, it's been fine for me to kind of go against that. What I would say with, around, with regard to the stereotype is communication is way more important than I think a lot of people coming into this field realize. So the, the engineers who are successful, although they might like to, you know, keep to themselves and they may not be the ones that turn up at a party, but they still know how to effectively communicate, especially with one another. Um, they might not, they might not be the person I'd want to, you know, stand and they might not want to be the, some, somebody who stands and gives a presentation or talks directly with a client, but they are able to converse, um, and be productive with their peers and have those conversations when are needed. Um, so those, that's kind of how I've navigated it and, and work with people um, on both sides of the stereotype. Work-life balance. So uh, this is something I've been getting better at because I used to um, not have much of a balance. It used to be all work or work-related things mm -hmm. and it's led to, well, led to a lot of burnout. Um, so, it's something I've been way more cog cognizant of um, in the last couple of years and how I've kind of done that is really being okay with stepping away from things and getting more um, chunk, like chunking my day a little bit more. So I'm, I'm remote. I've always been remote. Um, if anybody has any questions, I don't know if that, that, that was mentioned. Um, and so that's easy. Um, you know, it was easy for me to work all the time because I was always at my computer. So I've been, you know, dealing, working from home for years and years. Um, but I started to figure out how I could chunk up my day and take walks or go do something else, do laundry, just anything that got me away from the computer at like, you know, 11, like 1230, four, and, and kind of just take those breaks that I needed. Um, because I, in I choose to return a little bit in the evenings, but then not to spend all night doing that. So it was part of it was me becoming more disciplined and taking better care of my own health that, that worked with actually having a work-life balance. Because as you said, it's kind of, it can be a gray area when you're working from home and also, um, you know, at your computer when you're not working um, to kind of manage that. Um, using engineering for good. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> on this question other than like um, what I would say is this. So computer science, engineering, this field is like the only field I can think of that touches every other field and permeates it. Um, so if there's something that you really want to do with your skills, you can almost guarantee that there's going to be a way that you can do that. Like you can apply programming and go to that field and, and, and do something good there um, because everybody, everything is becoming digital. Um, everything's becoming automated. Um, computers and technology allow us to be more accurate and do things faster. And those two things, if you can go to any stakeholder, any business owner and say, I can make your stuff faster and I can make it more accurate and I can make your employers or your employees happier or better at their jobs. Like you'll, you'll win if you can do any of those three. So I think as you are looking for, for jobs, you kind of have to present yourself. You have to, you're like selling yourself. You're presenting yourself as um, someone that they'd want to invest in. And these are things that as an engineer, as somebody with these skills, you can do for that company. So you go there and you, you sell them on that. And it's not hard of a sell when you're in this industry because there's always opportunity. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would do. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Can I ask you a question? Okay. Yeah, go for it, Craig. Love to hey. see you on the chat. Hey, man. Paul, good to see you, man. Thanks for hey. being here. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Um, sorry for, apparently the JavaScript workshop started at the same time. It wasn't supposed to start for an hour. So if anybody's in here, JavaScript workshop still starting at the end of this, right? Um, I was just curious, Paul, from you and I talking before, you have done interviews with people. Like you have been in on interviews or interviewed potential employees, yeah. right? Yep. Um, in person or like Zoom or both? Both. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just curious because I know a lot of people uh, when I have coaching sessions with them and, and don't get me wrong, I understand uh, a lot of people don't like to be on camera. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't like to be visible. Um, what would you say in a recommendation if they're going to have to 
do an interview or something where they're talking to somebody, especially now with what's going on, they're not going to be a lot of personal interviews um, to get used to being on camera um, or um, I guess, what would you be your advice to them as far as uh, obviously the, the presentation, you know, almost like you're in person applying for something, but if you have to do an on camera interview or discussion with somebody, um, I guess, do you have any advice for that? Like in, in, in your experience, what you've seen, like it was like a, a bad thing, like, man, this interview would have went better, but fill in the blank or something. Um, yeah, I don't know that uh, there was, have been any bad ones because I guess the way I'm very um, conversational and um, relaxed when I've done interviews um, and because I want people on the other end to be relaxed and, and comfortable. Um, some funny stuff, like I've had somebody stand up and um, grab a bug, like just react, saw a bug on the, their wall and like reacted and like took the time and it was like hilarious. Um, actually I ended up hiring that individual. Uh, it didn't have any, any impact on the, the interview. It was just funny. Part of the, part um, of their debugging skills. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Sorry. Um, nice one, Craig. Um, nice one. Um, I don't know. I would say that if you're not comfortable, how to kind of overcome that. So, um, I, I guess for me, I've always been kind of in front of a camera. Um, but for folks that aren't, I would say find, you know, friends or whatever, especially now, like when I'm working, I'll hang out in, um, zoom or blue jeans or discord calls with people. Um, and so that kind of just got me used to just always having people there and, and kind of pair programming without being in the same location. Um, so you can do that like with folks, you know, people you meet in the career karma or, you know, friends or family that you have, um, it just to get used to it. Cause it can be weird, um, talking when there's nobody physically there, um, and getting used to that. And the way, the reason I would say get used to it or get used to it to a point is only because, in an interview, you want to try and be, um, make as much of a, a connection as you can. So if I can talk to you and see your face and see your reactions, it's a lot easier um, for us to relate in that way than to, for me to be on, on screen and talking to just a, a picture of somebody. Um, it's always nicer to, to see their face, interact with them and get that feeling like, like, uh, you do when folks are in person. Um, I, I, I would say there's a psychological benefit to doing that um, because if for the candidate, for them to actually show themselves and interact um, more so than, than me interviewing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think either that there's anything that deteriorates um, the interview by it being virtual. I think that um, you can conduct interviews just as well, um, you know, in person or over um, zoom or something. You say maybe they could get a, a practice buddy and do almost like mock interview too, like get on camera with somebody else. Just so you feel more comfortable. With somebody's cause the way I always see it, it's not any different than sitting across the table, talking to somebody, but some people just don't, they, I don't know if they see themselves on the camera. I mean, I'll be at seven 11. I just look up and see myself on the, on the screen. And I don't like, to, you know, I'm like, wow, do I really look like that? But some people are, I think more self-conscious, but um, just for practice sake, because especially the, with remote work and different things, you're going to need to be seen. Like you can't always get away with, you know, hiding, hiding from the camera. Right. So that's yeah. kind of why I was asking just to give men, any people advice based on if you've actually done interviews and seen people and, and hired people, and things like that. Um, kind of what was the, what was the, the going acceptable thing? Like when you have a zoom meeting, you want to be able to see that person. Do you, you require them to be seen or ask them to be seen or just don't require them. I would like, I mean, it would be my preference that I'm not talking to a picture or to nothing. Um, and I can talk, but, um, ultimately I mean, that's, um, it's a, it's a conversation and that's the biggest thing that I take away. So if folks don't want to, to share video for whatever, um, sometimes it's, they're on the road or they're just not somewhere with a great internet connection. So trying to show video would actually deteriorate the quality. And so just like turn it off. Um, so there's reasons that people might not want to, I would just say that it would be a, a benefit 
um, in most cases, in my opinion, for you to, to go on video so that folks can actually see you um, and you can make that, that connection with them um, instead of it only being one-sided. Um, to your point on pair programming, so that was something I had to get used to uh, many, many years ago, but something that I, when I had never done it before, and then I was asked to pair program or live program with somebody, um, I stumbled and froze and had no idea what I was doing. Um, my mind went blank and it was a terrible experience. I still remember that experience because of how terrible it was. Um, so I would also recommend, you know, as a, as an adjacent or tangential, um, comment to, to just being on cam is to also find somebody that you can pair program or just code in front of that you can sh screen share with and program, you know, you write the code while both of you are talking about it and then they write code while you guys are talking about it. Um, and really be comfortable with doing that because especially if you're going for remote, um, interviews or you're going for, you know, as jobs continue to go remote and there are remote interviews, um, that's something that you might not think, um, you'd be uncomfortable with, or maybe you, you outright do. I didn't think I was going to be uncomfortable with it. And then I froze and my mind went blank. So, um, practice on that highly recommend. Yeah. I just sent, um, a website URL to this place called, or to this website called P ramp or yeah, professional ramp, I guess is what they're trying to get after, but you can actually, um, practice these interviews like live, like with people. Um, there, there's so many resources for this. So after this call, like, we, we can actually create a whole thread and, and try to get all of these different resources to help you all do that. Melvin, I think um, Pramp, uh, at least they used to, I think if you signed up, I think you used to be able to do a couple free ones, I think. Uh, so I've, I've seen other people talk about Pramp before and you could do mock interviews and they match you up with other people but I think it coordinates and I think you can do so many free ones. And then after that, you, I think it costs you something just giving you just a heads up. Sorry. Yeah. I think, I think we can probably find a bunch of other free ones as well. That was just like one of the ones that I came across recently. Um, but yeah, there's so many resources out there. We, we definitely um, can crowdsource. So I think that Armen, yeah, Armen is up next. Armen, you want to ask your question? Thank you very much for your time. Um, my question uh, kind of is the following up with the, I think, Kava's question kind of. Uh, one, do you think everyone can be a software engineer? And as someone who begins, what are some of the skills and habits that you would recommend us to follow? Um, just making it a habit. Uh, as, as we develop to be a software engineer in the, in the future? Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, maybe not everybody is gonna enjoy the answer. Um, so I'll start off with, do I think everybody can be a software engineer? Um, right now, probably. Um, so I look at it in terms of supply and demand. So right now there is way more opportunity um, and jobs available in this field and there are qualified people to actually take those jobs. Um, that's, you know, statistically, that's what, that's what it says. Um, however, with any like market and as that um, demand is the supply decreases or the demand decreases for that, the supply increases and the demand decreases for that, um, we're going to come back down to a more, you know, traditional playing field with regard to, you know, comparison to other jobs. Um, when that happens, I wholeheartedly believe, and I don't know how many years this is going to be, um, but that programming is going to become a blue collar, the new blue collar job where a majority or a lot of the workforce is made up of your run of the mill developer um, or somebody who can, or has somebody who has developed for programming skills um, as more and more jobs um, pull a little bit of that into their their job requirements as technology evolves. Um, so what that's going to do to the market, uh, specifically the, the, with software engineers, is I think we're going to see the middle fall out of that. And I think there's going to be a big difference between your run-of-the-mill blue-collar engineers that are paid an average mid-class salary and the ones that actually can make money at doing this. Um, and when that happens, because right now, 
salaries in this field are highly inflated. I mean, they're, they're crazy, um, which I don't think is sustainable. I think you're going to see it drop, um, but not, ever, not for everybody. Like there's still, it's still going to be a way to make money. Um, so how do you get from, you know, here to here in this field? I think a lot of it is, um, it comes down to art. Can you, I don't want to say anticipate, but do you understand, um, and can you create business value? Um, do you, are you able to, to design and develop things without oversight and anticipate what is going to be in the best interest, um, of the company moving forward? Um, can you teach other engineers? Can you, um, yeah, share knowledge? Uh, can you, you know, do you, are you somebody that, um, you know, goes, is able to, to share that knowledge, has the knowledge, can share it and, and basically elevates everybody else around them because those are the ones that folks are going to want to lead, um, because they're going to, to elevate the rest of the team. Um, what else? And, and how do you get there? So constantly, what I would say is like constantly asking why, um, double down on your fundamentals and understand that first and then ask why and every time you're especially your first couple of years in the industry and where you're in a role that um, it's expected that a card's going to be drawn up with you. You might even be pairing with somebody on a regular basis. Um, you, it's expected that you're going to, you're not going to know everything. And you're going to be asking a lot um, to also ask why and to, you know, keep asking questions to dial down and actually understand so that you could go a game I used to play um, and still play every once in a while, but especially when I was learning this stuff, was I called it the why game. Um, I had a friend whose only job was to ask me why as I explained them a concept. And then they were, their job, they just kept asking me why. And the goal was I had to be able to explain it to them in a way that they could turn around and explain the concept back to me. Um, and only then would I believe that I understood it well enough that I was able to explain it to somebody else that they could explain it back to me. Um, and in a field that's so technical, I think that rule applies. Um, and that's why I enjoy teaching a lot is because it constantly brings you back to those fundamentals and challenges you to be able to explain things to other people. Um, so yeah, I would say learn things at that level, um, continue to push yourself to learn things and know things at that level and then share and teach other people and you'll elevate yourself in that process. Quick question. Hello. Yeah. Yes. What are the key differences from a junior engineer and a, senior engineer and another question is what is the expectations from a junior engineer yeah so it's it's going to vary depending on um the company but i would say generally um if they're hiring strictly junior or entry level engineers uh the expectation is that you can do the job with so some limited oversight, but with more so with direction. So the scope, so the card, um, if you're doing some scrum or agile process or the unit of work um, will be laid out for you. You will be given it and you can follow like and, and implement that with, you know, asking a couple of questions along the way and you're able to understand when to ask questions and not spend too much time on things. Um, but mostly you're just, pulling tickets off a stack. Um, once you move higher, uh, you'll move into roles where you're writing those. So product might come or somebody, you know, director, somebody might come and say, this is what we're going to be working on. Or this is what needs to be accomplished. And you're going to be like scoping that you're going to be saying, well, in order to accomplish that, we're going to need to do X, Y, Z. These are the things that need to be accomplished to accomplish X and put that into the backlog and then somebody's going to pull that out. That's already scoped out. Um, further up, you'll be doing things. I mean, eventually the higher you go, um, there's less and less of somebody else doing anything for you and you're still expected to provide value. So you're going to do that through understanding, you know, being involved with um, vision and direction of the organization, um, aware of competitors, market opportunity, um, and how can we, you know, bring things into market or how can we better serve our clients? Um, managing risk, managing tech debt. How do I allocate resources in the company um, and teams so that we can, you know, keep our costs down, but 
accomplish things faster? Like these are the types of questions you end up dealing with, which end up skewing a little bit more towards the business than um, actually writing code. It sounds mm. like the senior engineer, senior software engineers sound more like a project manager in a lot of ways than they are an actual coder. Depends on the company. Again, it depends on the company because, so I, I've worked at a company that was less than 100 people. Um, and I, I worked with a product owner, but I ran, I led the team and I worked with the, the product owner and the vice president to allocate resources to when we were going to hire um, and what we were working on, scoped all that work and, and architected the entire system. So I knew who was working on what and, and what needed to be implemented and oversaw that. Um, so it was a fair bit of like traditional, I mean, it was bringing the product to market. Um, and so it was product management in a sense, but I was also the engineering lead. Um, where I'm at now, we have product managers who work in the product side of the business. Engineering more or less just takes those requirements and figures out how we can accomplish them. Um, so you're less managing. Um, when you get to the engineering manager side, it's more like, how can I help these engineers accomplish their goals faster? They're not necessarily involved with product because um, they have product managers and stuff for that. As an engineering manager there, um, what does my team need to become more skilled or develop things better? Um, are, are we um, forming a good culture, working together well, you know, and assisting people, you know, with that uh, more than, so they're, they're doing less programming, sure, um, but it's not, it's not necessarily in replace for more project stuff. So I think um, Michael, Sasha, and Harrison have questions. So let's go with Sasha first, since she hasn't yet to ask a question, and then Michael will go right on to you. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is, if you're interviewing three people, let's just say someone has a master, another one has a bachelor's degree, and another one has a boot camp, what would have, or which would have more weight? What will have more value uh, in the interview? Doesn't matter. Like the degree for me, um, the degrees don't matter. But I can, I can tell you that I'm going to have um, concerns with each of them. It's ultimately going to be what is the the role for, and who who do I think can do it. Um, there are so um, the difference. The big difference, in my opinion, between people with degrees and boot camp graduates is that when you're in school you they focus or a lot of it is you learn the sciencey type of side of things um you learn time complexity space complexities algorithms things like that um if the if your day-to-day -day is going to be at that level then that stuff is important um fortunately a lot of positions have been abstracted away and you're not optimizing for time or space or anything at that level. Um, you're, you're up here writing a language where you can't optimize anything further than the language. So there's no point in knowing any of that because it doesn't affect your day to day. Um, so the, the graduates get a lot of that. They don't, what they don't get a lot of is how can I start being productive for a company and writing, you know, code that is of today's standard immediately. Um, what I see in the graduates is they often need to be onboarded to how to actually start writing code and learn things on how they're done today. Um, and so that's a, that's a risk that I have to be aware of is that there's probably going to be a level of onboarding time where they're not going to be very productive. Um, a boot camp grad or somebody who's self-taught, the benefit that they have is nine times out of 10, if you're trying to find a job, you're going to go, what is, what do I have to know to get a job right now? And so you start with what is going to get me employed today and start learning from there. So you don't have the sciencey stuff um, and some of the low level, you know, background and history, but what you do have is the ability to start being productive when I give you a problem um, because that's, that's what you've learned how to do. So um, that's why I think a lot of folks that are self-taught and come from boot camps do have an advantage. Um, some of the disadvantages of those, um, uh, or boot camps is 
in my experience, um, and again, this is just, I don't know any particular boot camp, but folks that have come out of boot camps is um, they tend to teach you how things would go if everything went well. And what I've found in some folks that have come through boot camps is that when something goes wrong, they don't know how to correct course and continue being productive. Um, so it'd be nice if, you know, somebody was able to do that. And a lot of the people who are self-taught constantly hitting that wall, constantly overcoming things, they know how to, you know, write their course and get back on track and start being, you know, getting stuff done again or ask a question. Um, so yeah, ultimately it comes down to, um, what am I hiring for? What do I actually need out of that person? Um, and can they do it? So all that wrapped up in, I hardly look at education. Thank you. Yeah. Michael, you got another question? Yes, uh, my question is, um, when you're like working with uh, people in the field and you're trying to like solve problems and you um, are asking questions, uh, I know the idea is you're not supposed to ask a direct question, you're supposed to ask questions in a way that they kind of help you find the answer. Uh, what are some things that you have done so that you kind of ask questions so that you can kind of learn and not just like hear the answer and, and do it? Yeah, so I'll say this, like I don't, I mean, it's fine. There's times when it's just like, just give me the, like, just give me the answer. I got to get something done. Um, but usually uh, what I like to see if somebody is coming to me for a question, um, especially if it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of work here is done autonomously. You're doing it on your own. You're working on something. Um, and if you come to me and say it broke or it don't work, you know, whatever, it's like, well, that's not a whole lot of context for me to actually like help you. I mean, I could just tell you to do some stuff and if that's it, it may or may not work. Um, what I like to see is something that's like, Hey, I'm running into this issue. I've done this and this and this and tried this, you know, it didn't, it didn't work, but it gave me this instead. It's like, here's the steps that you've already taken. Again, it's that balance between like not wasting too much time, uh, but taking some time and actually trying to figure it out. Um, and coming with a, with actual like steps and, and a potential solution and what you think might be the issue or what you've tried. Um, and then what that gives me on the other end is context around, you know, some things that I might even have told you to go do, and you've just saved us time by doing that ahead of time that I can now look at that and go, all right, well, and then based on that go, oh, this is the problem. Um, and, and come back and through that, um, you're going to learn things by having that trial and error. Um, and I guess if, if you want to learn more, ask a follow-up question. If, if somebody comes back and says, you know, you've done that, you go to somebody, you lay it out for them, they go, oh, it's, it's self-evident to me that this is the problem given this context and it works, then go back to them and say, well, what made, like, what made that so clear to you? That should, that should be the, the, next, the next question is, what, what stood out to you that made you go, oh, that's obvious? Um, Sometimes it is, and I, I, I recognize this, just having been doing it for so long, you see a lot of stuff. Um, as I was mentioning languages earlier, like you might not know everything, but in context, things stand out. Um, and that's just over experience. And sometimes the answer you might get is, I just looked at it and it stood out to me and, and that made sense to, to try this next. Um, other times though, you'll get, you know, oh, I've just made that mistake a hundred times before and I learned. So, um, but yeah, always asking like doing, doing that, that little bit of work ahead of time and then asking like, well, what, why was it so evident to you or what, what should I try next type of thing? Great. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, I did see from the questions that we received leading up to this event, there was one that's actually I think you might have touched on it a little bit, but it would be interesting to kind of further explore it. And so the the essence of the question is, um, since you are self-taught, right, it, it's super tough. Um, there are probably many mistakes that you've made and there's an overwhelming amount of information and learning resources that are available. Sometimes you don't really know how to like pick and choose um, or find mentors or actual humans that'll help you to get unstuck. Um, how, so would you choose to go through that self-taught route again, or would you choose an alternate route? 
or were there certain things about that whole journey of teaching yourself how to code? Would you do anything differently in hindsight? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would do anything differently. Um, one of the things I, I know I haven't touched on yet is sort of um, to elaborate a little bit on how I like taught myself. Um, so uh, yeah, I had been doing it for myself, just learning and building stupid projects and websites that solved my own problems. Um, then I found out people would pay me to do it. Um, so I kind of, I kind of adjusted my approach to it. And, um, I knew that I knew, like if I was working with a client, I knew that I knew 85, 90% of what I was doing, but then I'd take that other 10% and learn off of it. So it essentially boiled down to people were paying me to learn. Um, I was taking on work that I knew would give me an opportunity to learn something new. Um, and I was comfortable enough that if something went way off track and not according to plan, I could still make up that small piece. It wasn't too much that it would, it would can the entire project or there'd be an issue. Um, but by doing that, I kind of just, now I had an incentive and, and I was being paid and, and compensated. So I was able to align with like what I was doing to learn also with like making money. Um, but like resources um, and learning, like I, I still would be, would be self-taught. Um, the re number of resources that are out there, like, YouTube videos. I watch a lot of YouTube videos um, on conferences. Um, I attend a lot of conferences now. Um, so yeah, taking advantage of, of that. It's a very different time than when I started and I couldn't, like YouTube wasn't a thing. Um, the like I had crappy internet for many, many years. Um, so I would literally save and then have to wait two minutes before I could actually view the page so it would load. Um, yeah. So I, I, I mean, it's a very different time. I think that self-taught is easier quotes easier now, um, by having those resources out there, consuming it. Um, I also still do buy a lot of reference books. I have a entire huge bookcase, but back here. Um, so that's, that's still an option. O'Reilly makes some, some good books. All right. And so to close off, um, I'll go ahead and like ask you one last question. And the idea behind this question is that, there's so many valuable things that you have learned through your experiences and you, that you've so graciously shared with us tonight. But I want to make sure that the people on this call don't just let that go in one ear and out the other. So I want them to have something actionable, tangible that they can do this week to move them closer. So what is one thing that people can do this week to move them closer towards their goal of breaking into tech? Yeah, so... That's a good one. Um, and I did think about it for a little bit because I anticipated this question. Um, and I would say it's kind of, um, yeah, whatever. I, I mean, just do it. But what I wrote was um, make lots of mistakes and don't be afraid to make mistakes. So like this week, go do something, make a mistake and get back up on the horse and do it. Um, you're going to make lots of mistakes, get comfortable with making mistakes, fail forward. Um, one of the, the favorite questions that I like to ask in interviews is tell me about a, a time when you royally messed up or made a mistake or had, did something that had unintended consequences uh, because it's important to, it's important skill to have, especially in this industry that, you know, what do you do when things don't go according to plan? Because that happens a lot. So. All right. You heard it here first, folks. Make a mistake. I want to hear all of you guys talking about this on discussions. We'll have a post right after this with a thread where you can uh, drop your questions if you didn't get any, if you didn't get them answered by Paul. Um, we'll make oh. sure to get that YouTube recording. Sorry, I'll what was that? I'll, I'll share my mistake, one of my claim to fames, real quick. Um, yeah. so I, was, I was working on a website. Um, the website had a lot of clients on, an e on like an email list or newsletter thing. Um, and I had made some updates to the code and um, ran it. And like a couple hours later, we started getting phone calls and realized what had happened is, um, let's say there was like 600, 800 um, recipients on that list. Um, newsletter went out, but the first person on that list received 800 emails from us. The second one re received 799 emails. The third one received 797 emails. And essentially down the line, you know, the last person only received one. Um, but yeah, there was a, a bug in the code that I had updated that appended everybody's email as it looped. 
And so every time that thing ran in the loop to all 800 or so people, um, it just kept appending everybody's email. So yeah, lots of people got lots of, un well, they got the same email a bunch of times. And so that was, that was a fun time. Had to have a, a meeting with a lot of people and the clients and stuff on that, but we, we figured it out. But, yeah. But I bet those big, so those big uh, failures actually are the ones that, that hurt the most, but also like teach yeah. you, you, you won't forget that one. Never time. make that mistake again, ever. <laughs> but yeah, Great. I'd love to hear some of y'all's. Yeah. So everyone definitely visit discussions. We'll have that post. Um, would love to hear all of your, all um, like what you're going to, to try at, fail at, learn from, let us know. And Craig actually has a JavaScript workshop going on right now. So if you all are interested in learning, you need beginners to intermediates. He has that going on right now. So go ahead and jump into that. Um, if you haven't already, uh, Ruben also has his uh, kickoff going on right now. So we have plenty of things for you guys to jump into. Um, and until tomorrow night, everyone, thank you for joining me. Let's break in. Good night.